Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Conway Hall and tonight's London Thinks, which is the hashtag as well if you want to talk about this um, on Twitter. There's very good Wi-Fi here, and we're going to take some questions at the end. And in my experience doing debates here, this often kind of does get trending in quite a big way um, on Twitter, so it would be really interesting to see what you think. Um, the, the topic of discussion is, is two things in a way. It's the whole concept of intellectual safe spaces um, on university and the concept of trigger warnings, which is a very American thing. We'll, we'll get our panelists to help explain a bit more the idea that things that might be taught or things that might be discussed in university spaces might be upsetting and somehow students need to be warned or perhaps protected from it. Um, I might be wrong on that, I can be challenged on it. But at heart, I think we're having a discussion about free speech and what's happening to free speech on campuses here and why and how far it should be of concern. And I wanted to, so well, all our panelists come from a range of places and opinions. I'm gonna introduce them all briefly. Um, and I'm very much aiming to ask kind of the same question to everybody, so we have a real sense of the different views in the room. But I wanna start by giving an example of something that I heard on the radio two years ago, and I tweeted it earlier tonight. Jared Diamond wrote a book called The World Until Yesterday. Have any of you heard of it? It's about what we can learn from traditional societies, and he spent time living with a tribe in Papua New Guinea. And during the, and a lot of it was about how they respect their elders, and they have all these great things we could learn from them. But Bridget Kendall asked in the program, but what about women? And he said, well, when I was, I often teach the stuff that I put in my books, and the thing is most traditional societies treat women as subservient, I mean, really badly. And my female students got so up, quotes, so upset and angry, um, they couldn't believe it, that I decided not to have a chapter on it. So he left out a whole chapter, he left out a whole gender in his book on what we can learn from traditional societies. Um, well, he said, because his female students got upset, now I think that reflected very badly on Jared Diamond more than anything else, but that's, that's kind of the baggage I bring to this debate. I'm really interested that that was used as a reason to self-censor his book. And in a way, it felt like he was putting the blame on his students, but really, was that where the blame should lie? So let me introduce our panelists and we'll get going. Uh, Dr. Pam Lowe, who's sitting on my far right, is a senior lecturer in sociology at Aston University School of Languages and Social Sciences. She specializes in sexualities, feminist theory, and parenting culture. But crucially, she's recently completed a research project into student experiences of teaching and learning sensitive issues. So very much researching the kind of stuff we're talking about uh, today. Um, Beatrix Campbell is a feminist, a writer, and she wrote a, a letter to The Guardian earlier this year, expressing her concerns, which is signed by a huge number of, of prominent academics um, and broadcasters, her concerns about what she felt was um, a closing down of free speech, particularly of certain feminists on campus who were deemed to have unacceptable points of view. Uh, to my left is Brendan O'Neill, who's the editor of Spiked Online and, a, and is leading a campaign through Spiked on the whole issue of free speech on universities, which he feels is under threat and has been challenged. And we'll perhaps talk about some of your own experiences, including being blocked from taking part in a discussion on abortion, um, primarily because of your gender, I think. Yeah. Um, and our final panellist, where's my notes, is Baha Mustafa, who, are you still Goldsmith's diversity officer? Mm -hmm. yes. Welfare and diversity. Sorry? Welfare and, Welfare and Diversity Officer at Goldsmiths College. Became a news story herself, uh, allegedly for asking men to stay away from um, a BME women's event. This was a big story in May 2015, and perhaps you might want to talk a bit about what really happened and what was your experience of that. Um, and I wanted to start by asking each of you, and perhaps uh, Brendan first, to give me, actually no, I was going to ask you first, Pam, because you've done some research, an example of of something to do with this kind of issue. And that's even a definition from your point of view of what we're talking about when we're talking about intellectual safe spaces and the challenge to free speech. Um, well, I think that the idea of a safe space is a contested term and it's certainly used in different ways in different places. So I think that's important, important to realise. Um, as a, an academic, for example, I run uh, this, in my classes, I, like, I try and have a, what we call a safe space. But that's a safe space in terms of students being able to make mistakes and, and being respectful to each other. To, it's not about shutting down conversations at all. 
But a lot of the areas I teach are, um, could be seen as quite controversial. I teach, uh, I teach classes where we look at things like rape, where we look at abortion, where we look at those kind of issues as long, alongside sociologists, the mainstream issues like sexism, racism, homophobia, and everything else. So um, what I was interested in, partly because of the debates coming out of the US in terms of where students were reacting to discussing those issues in class, um, and asking for people to give out warnings and to actually label books as something distressing. So the idea coming. that, for example, Huckleberry Finn has racist language and you need to issue a warning that a yeah, student may stickers be. on books and, and stuff like that. So I was interested in particularly in how social science students who are likely to be students who are most embedded in these sorts of debates were experiencing issues in the classroom. Um, and I think it's important as well when we're talking about the university to make a distinction between the curriculum and other events, um, and that's a very important distinction to make. If it's in the curriculum, students have very little choice. They have to study it, whereas if it's an event, they can choose to not go and everything else. And so my research found that actually, um, which is based on universities around the West Midlands, is the fact that social science students want to discuss difficult issues. They did want to know what was coming up, you know, they wanted to know that rape was going to be the topic <coughs> under discussion, but there was nothing that they didn't want to discuss. Um, and I think that's quite a positive thing, and in opposition to some of the stories that you're hearing um, okay. from other places where people are asking for things to be removed from the curriculum. Um, B, in your experience, is this about the curriculum, or is this more about um, the non-curricular sort of events at campuses that you're concerned about? Well, my route into it... Mm -hmm is the non-curricular. My route into it is the drama of the banning by the NUS, or the no-platforming by the NUS, of a great feminist campaigner, Julie Bindle. Uh, I wrote a piece in defense of her right to write, speak. The Remind right us why the objection. The ban the, she, she got banned by a, um, initially a group within trans, gender, lesbian, gay, <laughs> X, Y, Z group within the NUS huh. that persuaded the NUS to not sanction her performance, vi you know, hosted by the NUS anywhere um, in any university. So effectively, she was banned. Okay. She was ba banned for two reasons. One, that she had written a very cheeky, very cheeky, quite naughty, deeply offensive, and in the view of many, many people, spot on, and in the, many, in the view of many other people, absolutely outrageously wrong piece in The Guardian about transgender issues. She aired things that are on the lips of probably many people who contemplate these things. And for that, she was to be punished with, as it were, NUS death. So I wrote a piece saying two things. One, I love the bones of this woman. I would pay her to be what she is, which is very funny, very cheeky, and an honourable campaigner on behalf of and provide campaigner for services for women who suffer life-threatening <coughs> sexual exploitation and violence. We should say prostitution is the other issue that has got a lot Hugely of people... Hugely present in this um, thing. Okay. So, talking, yes. um, my piece, I think, was significantly less alluring as a point of offence because it actually focused on the issue of no platforming rather than the transgender issues. Um, and many of us have fretted for years about why this ban has been sustained and reiterated year in, year out, and why Julie Bindle's political life has been blighted by this ban. It seems very, very disappointing. And amidst this fretting, something else starts to happen. Um, and there was a convergence at the beginning of this year of two or three things that galvanized Professor um, uh, Deborah, our Debbie, and me to prompt the, the letter that went into the Observer, and, and it was these. One of them, very close to my heart, because it was an eruption in the Green Party, of which I am a member. Um, a lecturer, a philosopher, writes something, again, a rumination, a philosophical rumination on gender, transgender themes. 
Rupert Reed was doing what he's supposed to do. He's a philosopher. He's supposed to think and ask questions and seek answers and write about them. And for that, a cabal at the centre of the leadership of the Green Party decided that he should be punished for wrong thoughts. Now, if you come from the kind of politics that I come from, I used to be a communist when communism existed. Um, I'm in the Marxist tradition, if there's a tradition. Uh, my, my feminism, which is the animating politics of my life, um, is inextricably connected with a Marxist approach to questions of exploitation and oppression and class and everything. Okay, so I'm used to having to deal with murder, mayhem, people being silenced in the name of the people. I'm just so, conscious that we need time. to yeah. crunch it. So we write this letter. The thing yeah. that was very interesting about it was the letter gets published and not particularly me, but some of our national treasures one of our national gay treasures, who was very troubled about the issue and signed it on the free speech issue, Peter Tatchell, was barraged by a ton, a thousand tons, minute by minute by minute, coming through his computer of abuse from transgender activists. He was reduced, this is a stalwart, like me, a street fighter. He was reduced almost to the point of tears. And Mary Beard, a national treasure, who signed the letter also, barraged minute by minute by transgender activists saying, you, do you know what you've signed? Brackets, you idiot. So that was my journey into this. Okay. The offence issue didn't particularly touch me, but it taught me a huge lesson <clears throat> that there is something vastly, ineluctably dangerous about feminists' efforts to talk and to challenge everything about gender. Because what's at stake here is that they don't any longer have permission to do the thing that their politics is about, challenge everything okay. to do with gender. We'll unpick some of these issues later. Uh, Brendan, give me um, your point of view where you're coming into this from and maybe a personal example of your experience of these issues. Oh, well, a personal example is I, I was restricted from speaking at Oxford University because I don't have a uterus, which is true. I don't have a uterus, what unfortunately. Was the, the debate was on abortion, and the, it was, there were due to be two men speaking, me and Timothy Stanley, me from the pro-choice perspective, him from the pro-life, or as I prefer to call it, anti-choice perspective. Um, and it was called off. 300 feminists set up a Facebook group, threatened to turn up with instruments uh, to disrupt the debate, and then the college itself caved, and it was uh, called off. And I thought that was a good example of how what we have here really is an interplay between intolerant students and coward cowardly institutions. Uh, but the thing I want to talk about, is not actually me, because it's kind of boring to talk about yourself or embarrassing. Uh, I want to talk about Dapper Laughs, because um, Dapper Laughs was, is a comedian. He's sexist. He has a fake tan. He's got a Cockney accent. I'm sure most of you know who he is. He was banned from speaking at Cardiff University. Uh, not speaking. He doesn't speak. He was banned from performing at Cardiff University. Um, no one said anything. No one complained about that. Who banned him? He was banned by the student union who said that his comedy was dangerous. His comedy would harm women because, of course, allegedly women are so fragile. And it would turn men into rapists because, of course, men are robots. It was this, uh, 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 this wall of prejudice was used to ban him from performing at Cardiff University. And my view on this debate is if you signed a letter to The Observer criticising the banning of Kate Smurthwaite from Goldsmiths, but you didn't say anything about the banning of Dapper Last from Cardiff, then your view on campus censorship is irrelevant. Completely... Can I just, sorry, can I just quick hold on, completely, Let him finish and then you can answer it all. Completely wow. and utterly irrelevant, because what we're talking about, if we don't talk about the instances like Dapper Laughs, then we're talking about technicalities. We're talking about who should be banned and who shouldn't be banned, rather than the principle of whether or not people should be banned at all. And I think the problem here is that even this letter in The Observer and other people, they accept the idea of no platform. They say, cool, the idea of no platform is great, but we should only apply it to neo-fascists, we, we should only apply it to the far right, we should only apply it to Zionists. 
Once you accept the idea of no platform, you've already conceded the argument. You've already conceded the principle. It's logical that it will then be extended to include Julie Bindel, people who are transphobic, anyone who raises questions about prostitution and feminism and so on. So we have to move this beyond being a technical discussion about whether feminists should be allowed to speak or not into a more principled discussion about freedom of speech, which, which by from. its very nature has to apply to everyone, including <coughs> both Dapper Laughs and Julie Bindel equally. Can we just, and the issue is, is what, what is the policy? And so maybe it would be really helpful if you spelled out what is this policy that you've agreed about, what isn't acceptable, yeah. what is acceptable in terms of acts coming on and in terms of safe spaces. So the safe space, I mean, I'm not gonna list out the whole thing, but ultimately the safe spaces policy um, which has been um, passed through our democratic structures, which you smirked at, um, uh, is basically um, asking that people, when they're on, camp uh, on uh, campus, do not participate in um, kind of oppressive behaviours. Because we recognise that the wider society, um, wider society means that um, is, is like, wider society often like uh, performs like, sorry, I'm. I'm really nervous. I've never done this you give me, but, but you've defined it. Obviously, you've defined Sorry. it in a policy. So you ran through a list there. Mm -hmm. You said um, it shouldn't be transphobic. Transphobic. So no transphobic. We don't accept like transphobia, yeah. um, Islamophobia, homophobia. homophobia. Islamophobia. There's like a whole list of uh, yeah oppressive behaviours which people generally participate in, and we just we just don't we discourage that, and we have zero tolerance to that. So how would you how would you police that? Because it sounds like it's quite a long list. Well, I mean, Is we're not fair? we're not this. <laughs> no, 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 I yeah, mean, yeah. no, uh, seriously, because it's all very well talking in theory, but if you've got a policy and you're working mm -hmm. with student union, mm -hmm. you know, you're applying principles. So transphobic, homophobic, Islamophobic, I mean, it might be anti-female. I mean, is it quite a long list of specific terms, would you say? Or does it rely an awful lot on people assuming, assuming people know what is meant by oppressive behavior? Um, I just no, want to clarify. Do, do, I mean, we do we do clarify it in the oh, safe space yeah. policy, but I don't have it in front of me, and it okay. is. Yeah. Can, can so. I chuck something in? Yeah. To this thing, I want to say two more things about the this particular um, this particular moment. Um, I was alarmed and disappointed by two two particular things in the way that this debate about no platforming and transphobia, whatever that is, was aired earlier this year. And the two things were this. I had a conversation with Diva magazine, which is a lesbian glossy magazine, about a year ago, saying, you know, this is, this is very, very difficult. Um, why don't you have, you host a debate? You're perfectly placed. You don't have a position on any of this. You're a lesbian magazine, and this is at the heart of gay politics, as well as actually, as it happens, more importantly, heterosexual politics. And Diva said to me, we should, yeah, we should, but no. Wow. We're frightened. That she said that. We're frightened. We're frightened. Of who? Well, they need to tell you. <laughs> okay. They're frightened. They're frightened, actually, of, I imagine, uh, my guess would be, um, trans activism's assault, fury, um, <clears throat> that they would find impossible to withstand. What they then did, however, was to print an editorial, having decided that they were too frightened to have this conversation, actually a conversation that then becomes a letter by two, initiated by two lesbians, me and Deborah, in the Observer. So this is Deborah, um, who? Deborah Cameron, Professor Deborah Cameron. Okay. Why did that name? Uh, Professor Deborah just Cameron, just a great on feminist on scholar at okay. Worcester College in Oxford. And just Oxford. briefly, because then we can get the, continue the, the response. But what they it. then do is to publish the response to our letter. It's actually an incomprehensible. Okay. I'd give somebody a star or a bottle of champagne if they could understand it to our letter. So the terror, interesting. I say to them. You are not allowed to be frightened. You are a magazine. <coughs> it's your responsibility to the lesbian discourse okay. that you I'm air conscious this. this is one specific area. But it's at the heart mm. of it. Fine, so it's a good example, but let's, let's get some other responses then. Brendan, you wanted to comment as well. Here. Well, sexual yeah. politics is at the heart of this, actually. Well, I, I think that's right, and that's the problem, I think, because I think the, these new kind of intolerant students are actually the, excuse my language, the bastard offspring 
of 1980s feminism, because I'm just about old enough to remember when feminists in the 1980s were demanding bans on pornography and misogynistic literature and anything else which they thought was damaging to women. So these older generation feminists now can't turn around in horror at the fact that there are younger feminists who are also demanding censorship. It just so happens that they have expanded the remit of censorship to include more people. It's a logical conclusion to a censorious climate that has existed for 30 years or so. But I think the, 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 the problem is this phobia <laughs> argument is insane. Everything is now described as a phobia. Yeah. Islamophobia, it covers not simply attacks on Muslims, which we all agree are horrific, but also criticism of the veil, criticism of the Quran, criticism of Islam which are entirely legitimate moral viewpoints. There are some people out there, including me, who think transgenderism is 21st century hocus pocus, right? And what? you need to... Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. you're so what? shocked, right? Exactly. Is that, as a Christian, would be shocked if you criticised the Bible. But you need to deal with that. That's a fact. These people exist. I can they deal want with to... it because I'm not a trans woman, therefore I can, I can, li I can live pretty, pretty safe. You can't like, deal with it no, because no, no, you can, safe no, can... space it out of yeah, existence. No, okay, and no, what no, I'm no, saying no, is that not... the problem is that what we have is the pathologization of what I consider to be legitimate moral viewpoints, whether they are on Islam, transgenderism, or feminism. These are legitimate are they, yeah, arguments. Just, just to be that clear, be Brendan, everyone else responds. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything you consider unacceptable? No. Well, oh no, I'm sorry. As it's, a viewpoint. Very easy. There's a lot of stuff I consider unacceptable and outrageous and offensive, but there is nothing that I consider that shouldn't be expressed and should, should well, be even undebatable. even child pornography? Are you saying, yeah. No, I'm sorry, ahead, if Pam. you're going for absolute free speech, then that has got to be included. Everyone has limits to this free speech. This is the argument but people no, use. Let, let, Pam, the boundaries, let Pam express a point right? of view here. So if you say, for example, child pornography is completely unacceptable, which I'm assuming you do, that means you have a limit to free speech. Now, where you draw on the boundary is different to other people, but that doesn't mean to say that there isn't a boundary. Well, let's deal with that, because and in I the think, 1970s, just, there was a movement to say yeah. child, child sex and child pornography, you know, there was a whole lobby to no. try, and, try and talk and about that as legitimate. Sorry, can so I do you accept... Can in you just, the let's 19, answer yeah. your specific point, and then you continue. In the 1970s, there was a movement, including by the, end, the National Council of, of well, Civil was, Liberties, there were to, people defend, linked to, it, yes. to defend the right of paedophiles to express themselves in writing. I would support the right of paedophiles to express themselves in writing. What I would be opposed to is child pornography because that is an act which involves raping a child. So this is something entirely different, but this is the card that is always played by people who actually just don't support the idea of freedom of speech. No, and no. because they can't say, I don't support the idea of freedom of speech, instead they say, do you support the raping right. of children? So just to no, clarify, I don't you, support the raping of children. But you'd say people children. have a right to express but, but there is, the idea uh, of People it. have the right, as, was, as happened in the 1980s, paedophiles were no, arrested for writing private letters to each other with fantasies about child sex. I would defend the right of these okay. weirdos and lunatics to Express write letters to each other okay. fantasizing Pam, about continue. child sex. Thank you I for think, clarifying that. I think there's a real difference between censorship and actually the ideas, right? Just because you have... Uh, you ask for people to think about things and express themselves in certain ways. That's not the same as censorship, all right? In my classroom, I will not tolerate people who make racist comments. That doesn't mean to say the question of racism is off the cards. Mm -hmm. And providing that they're not insulting each other, which I would not tolerate, that doesn't mean to say that any ideas are off, off the table. I don't know what's in Goldsmith's safer space policy. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'm guessing that the, behind the heart of these policies, because I've seen them from other student unions, is not that these things cannot be discussed, but that they need to be respectful mm -hmm. and to consider the way that these issues are discussed. All right? And I think that's an important distinction to make. So when you talk about free speech, it's, is it about the actual words that you use or is it about the ideas behind them? I think it's both. Also, well, let, let, also, go ahead. Like, there's, there seems to be this, you seem to have this like, assumption that like, students are intolerant or like, terrified or scared or like, although they're easily offended, when actually, like, and therefore we don't, we don't want to hear things that are uncomfortable. So when I did organize, the, the thing that kind of blew up in the media, which was when I did organize. Um, sorry? 
But yeah, when I, when I organized like a, a BME, which means black minority and ethnic uh, women and non-binary uh, students only, um, like a safer space where we can discuss this stuff, we didn't, we didn't sit talking about like fluffy clouds and like bloody, I don't know, like, like EastEnders and stuff. We talked about the kind of experience that we have as like minority genders, as minority people. Um, we talk about the fact that some of us are rape survivors. We talked about really fucking heavy stuff. Sorry, is it okay to swear? Is that okay? Free speech, whatever. We might have like, to edit that out of the screen. <laughs> like, really, yeah, I think, we you're, I think about, you're in a safe space. <laughs> um, yeah, we, I mean, we talk about the, the, the stuff that, like, the kind of experience that we have, and we talk about how we organise within, um, like, like, activism. So it's therapy. It's, no, no it's, don't, 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 yeah, that's don't really patronising. Don't put words in my mouth. Let, no, really let your answer. Congratulations. No, and don't, I think it's really important that we're polite and respectful. Go ahead, Baha. Oh, you, um, you invited the wrong person if you want politeness and respect. I think in a dis- discussion, it. it's really important. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, Let Baha finish. But, I'm, I mean, the basic the point I'm saying is that like, we're, not, we're not afraid of these subjects because we, these are our fucking like, lived experiences. These are things that we like, live with, okay? Like, we're not afraid of them. It's that we don't want to necessarily always be in a space where there are, like, people who we feel, like, might participate and perpetuate those oppressive kinds of behaviors because I'm someone who's had like dec- like I've had like a decade of, of organizing within like left-wing political spaces yeah with like predominantly like white like socialist men who talk over me who are like disparaging who were like really who 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 can talk the talk about feminism and women's liberation, and yet when it actually comes down to it, they don't recognize that the way that they behave with women on like a micro like level like can be really really, really shit, <laughs> like, and only perpetuates, like, misogyny and sexism. Um, and, and sometimes we want a space where we can just, where we can organise autonomously and bring that as, like, part of, a wide, of the wider movement. Let's, let's pin down some of these things, and I want everyone to respond, um, which is the principle that you're talking about, which is that actually a group, which is a minority group, can decide to self-organise and say, this is just for us, you know, and men or whoever it is, you know, aren't, aren't welcome because it's for a minority group. Do people understand, and ex- uh, mm. I, I mean, maybe everyone stop first with Pam, because some people object to that in principle, they say that should not be allowed on a campus. Yeah, uh, they do, um, but um, I think it's, you know, people should have the right to associate with whoever they want to associate with. Um, and, um, I mean, if they're on campus, for example, they've got no chance of actually excluding people because the campus is le- open, so you can ask people not to attend, but that doesn't mean to say that they won't attend, and you can't eject them if they do come. Um, and there's no university that I know of that would have rules other than that. Um, and it's difficult. Um, at Aston, I, I work at Aston in Birmingham. Aston has a significant proportion of... Well, well, I say a majority of my of BMA students. We have a significant um, number of Islamic students, for example, and our Islamic society, which was one which was, you know, sort of shut off in the media as, as segregating. But actually, that if you look, if you go, if you see the Islamic society events, and you walk into the room, and they quite often have women on one side and men on the other, but there's no signs telling people to where to sit. It's kind of And if you sit in the same, done. if a different place, nobody asks you to move. So, you know, who am I to turn around and say, right, you've got to mix mm. yourselves up just for okay. the sake of appearances? B, what's your view on this issue about specifically the idea of self-organising in a way and declaring actually this is not for some people? Because wasn't it like women, that in the past too? Well, well, you know, women have always had to navigate this question. It's always a question for us, and we always have to make, offer contingent answers. By which I mean, we live in a world full of men, and now and again, just now and again, maybe it's once a week, Women have sought to be only with each other. When I was in my 20s, I was never in a room, ever, with only women. Until the women's liberation movement happened Mm -hmm. and sought to defend that space as a space that wasn't us lot dispatched to to the kitchen when men watched what was then called Match of the Day, um, when we were supposed to be having a party. And the first time 
that I was ever in a room with a group of women who were my peers, who wanted to be with each other, I have never forgotten. It was absolutely ecstatic. It was dangerous. There was a frisson of complete shock attached to it because it was so unexpected. The sense of danger was that, of course, it created the opportunity for those women in that room, who many of whom would have been suffering all sorts of crap in their lives, because women are oppressed. We're managing that stuff all the time. So it became a place where you could risk contemplating it now and again for once and that's a week. And do you know it was such a hard thing to defend? There were women in that group. I should think my first women's liberation group, half of the women in it couldn't survive in it because the men in their lives wouldn't let them. So it's a really tough thing to pull off. And the thing that I think gets forgotten in the conversations about those moments when women just want to be together is how rare those moments are. Do you know what? I think it's interesting to remember that history and also how far there's a backlash element because it's just the odd thing and it gets a lot of media attention that men say, well, why can't we come to this? But, you know, the Garrett Club still doesn't let women mm. join because it's a private club. Is it really worth making such a fuss over these things when women's spaces, there's a historical reason why sometimes they're sought? My view is if it's a private space, if it's a private club, if it's a private institution, then you have absolutely all rights to discriminate against anyone you want. You can just be a gay men's club, no straight men allowed, women's club, no men allowed, that's absolutely fine. When it becomes a public meeting, when it's advertised to the public or you have a speaker from outside the university, then I think it's a problem if you discriminate and if you say women must sit here and men must sit there. So as long as it's a private institution, you can enact any form of discrimination you want. As Hannah Arendt said, the freedom to discriminate is a central part of the freedom of association. So I, I completely agree with that. My problem with the, the new feminism on campus is that it is driven by victim culture. And it's your driven problem is by... That your problem is full stop with feminism. Your yes. history, actually. And I think I, think I want to... Let's talk about feminism. Yeah, let's, let's do can it. Can we do that? Let's do it. <laughs> right. Let's do it. Bring it. Because you see, your... Let's talk about Satanism. Wow. What does that even well, let's mean? start with feminism, and then let's see where we go. And then we'll move on to Have feminism. that branded on your brains, my friends. Bring it. Come on. My problem, is with, my problem is with new feminism. And what I mean by no, your new feminism... Your problem is with feminism. No, your, my your problem, problem is with what feminism. You think. I, Stop, yeah, feminism. Stop telling me what my problem is. Right. I'm trying my to problem is with you. Is your <laughs> problem with feminism. Okay. Because, and can I just... Because it goes to the heart of this issue. Right. Let me just... Briefly, because actually Brendan was responding. I know what my problems are. I, I should be allowed to... Right. Let, let Brendan finish, because you were, you're in the middle of making your point. You said your problem with the new, my the new problem, feminism, whatever that think, is, think is. I'll talk to my you, problem, actually. And my then we'll problem, get everyone to respond, B. Go ahead. My problem, <laughs> my problem with the new feminism is that it's driven by a victim culture. Now, the, the second wave of feminism in the late 60s, early 70s, was driven by an idea of autonomy, an idea that women were capable of negotiating public life without needing the assistance of, of men or institutions or anything else. What you have now is and a new what you have now is a new and feminism. And pillaged. No, let, let him finish. Why? What, what you have let now finish. is a new feminism which is entirely about presenting women as incapable of negotiating public life, no. incapable of seeing offensive adverts, they do negotiate incapable, life. incapable of seeing page three, incapable of being at a university and, and being chatted up and being asked if they want to go on a date. My I mean, problem with the new feminism is not that it is. is a war on men, but that it is a war on women. And it calls into question, it calls into question the capacity of women to negotiate public life on their own. Can the I reason I mentioned, hold on, the reason I mentioned, the reason I mentioned, the reason I mentioned Satanism, which may have struck many I'm people right. as ridiculous, <laughs> is because in the 1980s and the 1990s, there were a whole swathe of feminists, including Miss Campbell, who argued that Satanism was rampant, child abuse was rampant, women were being raped left, right, and center. And yep. my personal view... My personal four. view is that that contributed to the very victim culture that is being carried on by students today. So this idea, this idea that there is a chasm-like 
difference of opinion between these two groups is, in my view, false. Okay, let everyone can I just, can I just ask Brendan, first, then be right? in and how much feminist theory have you actually read? Do you Too know much. what you're talking about? Too much. No, 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 you haven't. You've, you've looked at the media, you've picked out instances, but have you actually read any feminist theory? Because if you yes, had, you would not see that there is the, the so-called victim feminism it, it's a tiny minority well, of the broader strand what of feminist What do you mean by victim? What does that mean? What do you mean by victim? Can you break if that down? If only we knew. Because I don't understand what, what well, you mean by that. I try and briefly explain it. No, victim please. feminism. No, don't. Don't. No. Because you're making no. it up as you go I along. Think, Are you serious? I think, yeah, no, wait, I am serious. What do you know? Victim feminism is the idea that women have an inferior form of autonomy to men, which means that public life needs to be rearranged in order to f make sure that women aren't offended or that their self-esteem is not damaged. And that, to me, as a humanist, I find that an offensive right. idea. Which, which feminist theorist wrote that? Excuse me? Which no, feminist no theorist wrote, wrote that? <laughs> Every single... Bell Hooks. It's even in the works of Germaine no. Greer, the later works of Germaine Greer. No, it's it's in most no. of the new feminist theory. Right, well, I'm going to say is now, it mine? as someone who did women's studies okay, for right, one right, people, okay, most right, people right, here won't have read a lot of feminist theory. Okay. And, it's ir and I don't think it's directly relevant to get bogged down in who's read what. I think the idea of how we operate as a society and our attitudes is what we're discussing in, in the context of universities. So I want everyone else to continue responding to you. It's really strong... Points, and I think it's important people respond to Baha, you know. I was just, well, I mean, it sounds to me like when you say victim feminism, which I, I, I don't know where you've plucked that from, it's really strange. Um, it kind of sounds like what you're assuming is that, like, women have had no part in, like, in the kind of negotiation of how we, how we envisage our liberation, as if, like, someone on a pedestal somewhere has been deciding what feminism should look like. Uh -huh. um, but actually, this is the... This is, and this is not, I don't completely, I don't completely disagree with you on that either. Like, I, I don't particularly want, like, like, the white kind of mainstream, like, feminism that's, like, kind of very seeped in, like, colonialist kind of, like, imaginations of, like, what women's liberation looks like to kind of be, describe my experiences as a, as a, as a woman. Um, this is why we need, like, safer spaces and autonomous spaces and caucuses so that, like, people who are affected by those, like, by those, um, by structural oppression, by like sexism and racism and misogyny and trans misogyny, can actually like negotiate the terms of our liberation. Negotiating it on their like, own terms, that's the issue, isn't it? Whether university students have a right to define for themselves mm -hmm. what they think is acceptable and that they can redefine it. Uh, yeah, but the problem is that that has a knock-on effect on other students who are not permitted to say certain things. Now, I think there's a real double standard here. So we talk about the right of feminist societies to have women-only meetings or, or black people-only meetings, and I support their rights so long as they are private meetings. But then you have this war on... For example, rugby clubs or lad societies or these kind of laddish, stupid laddish parties that young 18-year-old boys have when they go to university. So you can't have this double standard of saying that it's fine for BME societies to have these meetings at which only they are allowed to attend and everyone else can frig off, and then say that these other groups, but isn't it about these working class men, societies? are not allowed to organise in the way that they want to. Right. Can you give an example of like a, a rugby because a rugby club? London School of Economics. The so rugby LSC, club has yeah. been banned, right. and people are now standing. These yeah, young why? lads are standing in the streets with these Maoist signs hanging around their necks, saying, "I'm a good lad because I accept gender theory." Yeah, when but, you have no, but tell students, us about why because there was an incident. Because they had they published a leaflet which had offensive words on it. Now. If we're they were encouraging about... people to rape women. They were. They, oh come yes, on! They were. Are you serious? They were, they were talking about getting women drunk enough to not be able this to is, say no. This is That's... this is untrue. They I think wrote... there was a real issue about right. I'll, I'll tell you the what behavior it was, because towards women in that leaflet. They wrote a there? leaflet. In, they they handed out a party leaflet in which they used the word mingers and they used the word homos, I think, or queers or something like that. Right, we're here to talk about freedom of speech. I want to know if this panel supports the right of a rugby club to issue a pamphlet or a leaflet with the word mingers on it. Well, is it the mingers or is it the other word the, that, you know, I think mingers under is, law, you could argue that. Do you one support of those the right of a rugby club to use evil. the word mingers on a public leaflet? Yes or no? Well, not if I'm paying for it. Well, there you go. These uh, guys don't uh, believe no, in no, freedom no. of speech. Student unions are funded partly through taxpayers' money. Brilliant. 
Brilliant. So, uh, no, I don't want to pay for that. They're quite this entitled the, to this pay is for it the themselves. This is the end really of the discussion. No, 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 Brendan. This is the end of the discussion. We no, can Brendan, all go no, Brendan, I said they're quite entitled to pay for it themselves and publish it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like it, but I don't want to pay for that. I don't want to pay for offensive words. To be, why should I pay for offensive words to be met? It's an be issue painted. behind it all about privilege, dare I say it, and particularly the idea that what's considered a neutral... A logical position is often that that has been taken traditionally by white privileged men who then who aren't the ones who get leaflets written about them with offensive I mean what are the offensive terms for white straight men compared to the offensive terms for women for gay people lads, you know for black people lads rapists lapists rapists oh my god I'm sorry I'm sorry but like rapists I mean it's, it's, rapist, a, it's not endless. every man is called it's actually, rapist lads rapists misogynist sexist it's kind of endless I've, actually like, okay, so receive so a so that again, um, no I'm just saying most like we played this game just the other day I played this like really fun, not really that fun, uh, word game with like with some students in which we put we got a bunch of like words that are traditionally seen as like you know like offensive blah blah. blah put them up and we have to like decide whether they're um, okay to use, dodgy, never okay, that kind of thing. Um, and I realised that like a lot of the words that were coming up were all gendered and were all gendered against women, really, and also homophobic and also like. Um, transphobic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There were, there aren't really, like, there aren't really that many offensive words to describe white men because, like, there is no like system of oppression that puts down white men. So, like, that term, where, white, tell me, that tell term, me, tell me what lad means. Tell me where term, lad came from. Tell term, me how it's white, offensive. That term, white men, to describe a whole swathe of society which have, who have, who have vastly different views and which include upper class people, lower class people, middle class people, working class people. That in itself is a generalisation which you would be opposed to in relation to any other strength. Section sure. of society. It's a question, no? isn't it, about if, if there's a question about common sense agree? in here, isn't it about whether yeah, yeah. white men it's, as a group it's, have, are suffering in the discrimination and there are real issues about a, wh um, a white working class status man, in society? A white working class man can, can experience oppression, but he experiences oppression Thank because you. he's working class, not because Brilliant. he's a white man, because he's working class. That's very different. Because this whole, there's a term offence sweepstakes, which I've seen used in an article by an American academic about the idea that. If you have a culture in universities where everyone's claiming, well, I'm more offended than you are, actually, white privileged men start using that too. Um, so you have the sports clubs, but you know it's all right, you come in next on this. But the, um, <laughs> that you have sports clubs saying, like the rugby club example, that actually we're being oppressed. If they are banned, I don't think they're oppressed. I don't think men are oppressed. Oh, I think men's God, rights activists you. are the saddest people in the world. Thank you. But we can agree group, on that. Yeah, we agree on that, right? Yay! They are sad people. They blame feminism for the fact that they can't get laid, the fact that they can't get jobs. It's pathetic. But if a group is banned, can we please agree that's a bad thing? No? I think, I, I think it depends, no, but I think... Right, okay, about, okay, I think again, take an example. I, I mean, it's yeah. the British yeah. National Party, if the BNP, and I remember when Nick Griffin was a student at what was then the um, Polytechnic of North London, and there was a huge student opposition to his very presence because he was a fascist. Um, mm -hmm. But if the BNP wanted to organise a membership mm -hmm. of students and have meetings, and they had students who happened to be members of the party at that university, are you saying no one has a right to say we don't want this? Absolutely. Because I believe in freedom of speech. But some people's freedom Be, of speech... Can I change some, the topic? No, some let, let Baha finish, then, speech, then please, change. Go ahead. Please, some, freedom, some people's freedom of speech, so, like, the freedom, the freedom for fascists... Because their speech isn't just... Their speech isn't just, like... It's not just, like, it exists in this kind of, like... like um, abstract like world. There's actual like violent consequences to the kind of things that they believe. How? The kind of, well, because they organise and go into community. No, they organise and go into communities and actually like um, attack and like and and like attack like people of colour. They attack. Um, uh, but then communists. they should be they arrested attack. for attacking people. But you I don't. I don't believe that speech is. I think you'll find that there's, there's actually laws. I believe communities should come together and decide democratically how they. discrimination. So. Actually, it's relevant to bring up here. It's very well saying anyone should be allowed to organise. But there are laws around um, homophobia, around racism, um, and around um, religious discrimination, I think. And I just wonder, is it just a matter of waiting for someone to attack? Or do you accept that actually free speech on a university campus can be framed in the same way? For example, if something is considered racist, it doesn't de depend primarily, I think, on whether the person making the comment thinks he was being racist. It depends on whether it was perceived as being racist by the person reporting it. That's, that's in law, and I've, isn't that where this all comes from? But I believe in freedom of speech, which means I'm against banning even racists. 
That's what freedom of speech means. It see, means you must defend freedom assumes, for people who you, you people don't. who you loathe. You don't. People who you loathe. You if don't. you don't defend freedom for people who How you long loathe, do I have then to you don't not believe in freedom you of speech. Respond you don't then. defend freedom of speech, actually. Oh God. Tell me how you I don't, don't. Do defend well, freedom of speech. Well, you know, you've written recently about how these so called it would be your word, so called victims of Jimmy Savile, for example. Why don't they shut up? No, I didn't say that. Actually, what did you say? You said, why don't they just shut up? It's it was in the past. Why don't they shut up? Why don't they maintain a dignified silence? So can, I think can you, you all use your phones to Google this article I wrote? Because this um, is a vast misrepresentation. A vast mis of oh. Do you think you know what, she's, what? what article she's referring to? I wrote to? an article in which I argued that it was improper of society to invite people to revisit every bad experience in their life. I did not improper? say... Improper? I don't know. I did not say that these people should stop speaking or they should be banned or they should be censored, unlike feminists who in the but 80s... You invited them to shut up. ...argued that fascists and pornographers should be censored and feminists in the 2010s who argued that feminists should be censored. Okay, can I, I just... have never once argued that anyone should be restricted from expressing no, you, themselves. You didn't, you didn't say they should be banned. You just said, why don't you shut up? And actually, you keep on and on and on about your difficulty. And this is the thing that I really want to talk about. The difficulty with hearing the kinds of things that oppressed, marginalised, humiliated, raped and pillaged groups Come of people... Come on. Come on. Uh, you talk, uh, well, shall we finish, talk about your think. destruction of working class families with your uh, lies about Satanism in the 1980s? Is that what we're well, going to talk about? Well, you've already raised that issue. Is that Let's... what we're really going to talk about? Shall we about? let B finish when I'm points, talking about When I'm talking about the child abuse panic, I'm talking about the extraordinarily destructive impact that it had on working class families who were falsely accused of raping their children. And as B said, in Marxism today, shitting on silver trays and forcing their children to eat it. They didn't do that. Okay. You made it up. So if we're going to talk about freedom of speech, I, I okay. would support... I would support... Okay, let, let me respond. I support okay, the freedom of speech of people to make... Okay. No, no, we'll I take support questions later. the freedom of speech please. of people to make things up about Satanism. Right. I do not support Benjamin, the freedom to destroy really working-class families. I don't want this to turn into personal. Okay. Okay. No. Well, fine. B, go ahead. <laughs> B, go ahead. The conversation I really want to have um, is this. It's about not so much freedom of speech, but the difficulty of speech. The difficulty for those who need to speak the difficulty of giving voice, particularly if what they need to say has been shrouded in shame, whether it's about the shape of their body or somebody abusing their body. This is at the centre of the experience of women forever, as far as we know. Now, the thing that's fascinating about that difficulty is that all sorts of other oppressed and marginalised groups have something to say about that as well. Primo Levi describes, let me just remind myself of the ways that he puts it, um, the, the unlistenable to, the unlistenable to, the unheard things that need to be said. Well, let's just remember where the great inspiration for the contemporary language of feminism came from. It came from people who defied death in Mississippi, in Alabama, just to vote. Black people who, in order to vote, had to risk life and limb and had to actually recuperate some sense of personal worth, which they recovered amongst each other to give voice and to enter the public realm. Now, the thing that I think is shameful about you and your institute of no ideas... I don't work is, with the institute of ideas. I know you don't, but you're associated with them and you come... <laughs> What's shameful? Go, go, go ahead. Shameful What's is this. Shameful? I want to just refer all of us to an article that you wrote about, again, your thing about rape. And you had a go at this current rape thing that you, you go on about. And you likened contemporary feminism to the Ku Klux Klan. 
and you sight that great, heroic, astounding figure, Ida B. Wells, who campaigned against lynching and particularly mm -hmm. named the ways in which She's my hero. white people enlisted the spectre, your term, the spectre of rape to lynch Thank black you. men. The thing that you do is to deduce, to erase the history of black women at that time in the service of your repudiation of the implications of rape. Wow. And you know how you do it? Because you cite Ida B. Wells' campaigns against lynching, but you ignore Ida B. Wells' condemnation of the priority attached to the raping alleged of white women and the way that the institutions and white people ignored the routinized, institutionalized, sexualized slavery endured by black women. And indeed, you also ignore the great movement of black club women in the South and in the North of the United States who insisted on the politics of rape, asserted a politics of rape, who insisted that white women and men take responsibility, take their hand off those white men who routinely raped black women. Mm -hmm. You just erase that story. Oh, Why? Because something is more important. You want to use black women and the movement against lynching against all women. Can I just say something? Can, please, no, can, I share, no, can I, no, this is really important because this is now turning into you both citing each other's articles at each other. It's got no, very I'm personal. To say, this is, can I respond And you've both something? done that. Well, you've, you've raised it first. B's responded oh, with on. that. Right, sorry, so I think, well, let, no, let's... Well, no, I'm trying to say you've that, I'm trying to say that this is... Right, okay, no, so I would like to get it back to an issue which involves the whole panel now. Which is about the way in which things can be spoken things can be heard, and the contemporary conversation... Can I respond, please? Yeah, respond briefly, but can we then move on and bring about it back freedom to the main has to has to navigate in what conditions the terms of engagement can be defined. Because these things are never absolute. Actually, why should any woman turn up in a room and talk to you? The one thing that she can learn from you is the politics of contempt, the politics of disrespect, the politics of... Uh, Wow. Can I please right. respond Brendan, to go ahead, and right. then we're going to the politics up, and the I want to hear The Pamlet. first thing I want go to ahead. say is that there is a vast difference between criticising feminism and criticising women. To conflate those two things is like saying criticising Islam is the same as hating all Muslims. Criticize, feminism is an ideology. It is open to ridicule. It is open to questioning. It is open yeah, to criticism. that's what you spend your lifetime doing. No, I don't spend my lifetime doing it. I write articles that criticise feminism. It's an ideology. It's a perfectly it's legitimate thing to criticise. It's not the same as criticising women. It's particularly not the same as criticising women today when feminism has become a completely elitist enterprise. You, what you don't pay but attention what I'm to talking is... about in relation to the Ku Klux Klan article that you mentioned is that one of the driving forces behind the lynching of black men was the idea of a rape culture. The idea that black men were given to rape, were violent, that white women were victims, that white women were under threat. And what I was doing was comparing that to the modern period in which we have a similar idea of white comparing women being under Ku threat. Klux Klan. Under threat. Comparing now, okay, if you... Well, I think you've well. both tried to explain I, the positions on this. Yeah. I want to move it on. Pam, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so there's a number of things. First of all, I think that to say that feminism and ideology is distinctly wrong, right? Because feminism is a huge, huge, broad political... Yeah, no, I am serious, right? There is no ideology of feminism. It's right? ideologies, then. It's, it's feminisms with an S, right? right? Okay. And then none of yeah, them are doing great. And that. it's not an ideology. It's, but it's a not political movement. It's not related to women. The vast majority of women have zero interest in this feminism. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Brendan, really? you see, if you, all <laughs> feminism is, is a Why broad is this agreement. With this broad no, I yeah, know. Yeah, I yeah. have to say, Brendan, sorry, I'm going to stop you going on about what you think all feminisms are because I don't think it's taking us anywhere. And we Can are I talking about on? students, universities, yeah, yeah. and the reality right. of free speech debate. Okay. So let's put okay. it back to that. I agree with you. Right. I agree so with there, is a, there is a. There is a term which linguists use, um, it's not my field, which is called speech acts. Have you heard of this, Brendan? I have, yeah. Right. So in other words, the words that you say is, is 
obviously has meaning, but the context in which you say them can change the meaning. Yeah. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. And that's what's at the heart of some of these debates, right? Clearly, if someone says, you know, I'm going to kill you, and it's your best friend, and you're having a laugh in the pub, it's not serious. If a stranger says to you on the tube, you might take it more seriously. And that's what we mean by speech acts. And the problems with a lot of the stuff around, around free speech on campus is that it, that it doesn't necessarily take into account the context in which it's what being spoken. And that's what I come back to at the beginning, this distinction between the curriculum and other events, right? So as far as I know, nothing has come off the curriculum in the UK in terms from student demands, right? So this idea that, that students are demanding things not to be taught. In the UK, mm -hmm. as far as I know, that hasn't happened. There are some things that have come off the curriculum, um, and I can think of, the main one I can think of at the minute is terrorism. But that's not come from student mm -hmm. demands, that's become off it because of the prevent agenda. Mm -hmm. And some staff do not feel adequately supported. Well, this is in kind of politics courses. Yeah, yeah, this. yeah. So, uh, so some staff do not feel their universities would support them but in teaching The problem that. is extracurricular activity, so which is being So in the UK, censored. but extracurricular activity is extracurricular activity. Right, and that's that's not a part. Nobody has to attend. No one doesn't have to attend. So it's like any other public meeting. Mm -hmm. And if you have a public meeting, people have a right under free speech to stand outside and wave placards and say we don't want this to go mm. on. And that's all it is. Okay, I think so you know what you're you're kind of no 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 wait just let finish because I want Baha to come in as well on this. No. So your real offence with this is actually at people actually making a free speech point that we don't want to hear so from this people. Enacting censorship is an act of freedom of speech. Well, I think it's the idea. I mean, the crucial Brilliant. phrase was, you know, Brilliant. that's all it is. It's people defining things as they go along and changing social attitudes are perhaps reflected on campus. Baha, is that how you would see it? Sorry, could you repeat that yeah. again? Well, just... the idea that, especially when it comes to the way students organise, so extracurricular activities, that the debate around what is and isn't acceptable mm -hmm. is a phenomenon of social change and social attitudes, and it's debated. No it's way. not imposed from above. I mean, how would you define um, how these things... I mean, did you just I mean, say inherit a code of this is what's acceptable? Or would no, you say it's been changing even it, in it your time? It has been fluid. It has been changing. Um, um, and also, like, the, the thing that you're, like, you seem to be assuming, or, like, some people assume when they talk about, like, um, censorship on campus and banning on campus, um, is that... Uh, when student unions do this, is that like we just kind of decided amongst ourselves what is and isn't acceptable. What's actually happened is, it's, again, it's gone through like our democratic channels, and students have uh, over, students have voted for the students are free. Like in this, we have direct democracy, uh, which is one member, one vote. We have resources that are, alloc that are used to alloc which we allocate to like students and to the running of like students' union to, and to improving student the student experience. And if students decide democratically they, that this is a motion that they want, this is a policy they want on their campus to be enacted, then we as student officers are mandated to, okay. let, to respect that. Let Brendan respond specifically to that. There is a process and it's a democratic one on no, campus. No, seriously, student union politics is not democratic. I mean, seven, sorry, how, seven people vote in these things. It's, it's, not it's, seven, it's well, insane. that's their choice, isn't it? it, it how many right, people, how many people is, voted in the, in, in like the, the general in elections? Seven, more than seven. But there, the thing yeah, is, more than seven what I'm saying up is, to assembly, what, this has been a very useful discussion because it's had, there's been a very clarifying process going on here, which is that these three guests all agree that there should be restrictions on freedom of speech. Now, if you accept no, we, the idea that students have the right I, to restrict... I haven't said that. I haven't said that. Come on. Can I finish one sentence? I think, no, I think freedom of speech in and of itself... Can I finish well, one sentence? I think freedom of speech you're saying I they think. Can I, think I finish one sorry, sentence? Sorry, I just want to... Just because I think that your idea of freedom of speech assumes... As pre again, assumes that everyone has an equal platform to speak, but not everyone does have an equal platform to speak, which is why there are some people whose voices are much louder. Which is why you must remove some louder. people's platforms and give them to other people. There's another word for that. It's censorship. Now, what I'm talking about is when you have... I mean, Wait. it's just logical. When, when you argue that it's fine for students themselves to enact extracurricular censorship, you're actually giving credence to the idea of censorship. Now, it's not the, censorship. the argument it, not it the is state. it we is the like, argument no hold on wait wait I want to talk about the state. Oh and someone said something it offensive. because it's a fundamental my, that we, one, there's a disagreement the, the, on. the person who I get most of my views on liberty from is John Stuart Mill. Now in on liberty 
He, oh, hilarious. Yeah, a white man. It's so funny. In no, On Liberty. Shit. That's it's hilarious. hilarious. <laughs> white privileged male. In On Liberty. There's he a lot argues, of white men who I agree with, but he's just right, shit. He's not hey, one let, of them. Yeah, of course. Point. Because, yeah, because he believes in freedom point. of speech. Go ahead. Um, my, uh, right, John mate. Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill argues that state censorship is not necessarily the worst form of censorship. He talks about the tendency of society to enforce its views by other methods than civil penalties. And he talks about conformism, the pressure to conform, the pressure to go along with received wisdom. Now, if you only challenge state censorship, I challenge state censorship. That's I do that pretty much all the time. Mm. If you only challenge state censorship, then you're missing a trick. Because throughout society, there are other means in which conformism is enforced. And one of the key means on campus is through student unions presuming that they have the moral authority to say that certain speakers can't come, that certain people can't express themselves, that Islamophobic ideas can't be expressed, that saying transgenderism is bullshit can't be expressed. That is you censorship. Can express it. That but is censorship. I don't care censorship. if it's being done by a government or if it's being done by someone who looks radical. It's censorship. <laughs> now, what we've seen here, I think, B <laughs> obviously is more than capable of speaking for herself. But so far, I am the only person who's putting the argument for freedom of speech on campus. No, you're, uh, you're completely wrong. Right? What I've said, uh, and if you'd listened to me, you'd have heard this, oh. is that in the classroom, Everything is discussed, right? That there is no bans. There is nothing that is not discussed in the classroom, in the curriculum, which it should be at the heart of the university, right? That we don't have censorship. But outside of that, it's okay. Okay. What? What? Out, the university. Out, Unbelievable. No, student unions are not the university. The university doesn't govern students. Students organise themselves. So to claim that universities support censorship when student unions are doing organising themselves, that's a complete conflation of no, two different No, it's not conflation entities. because when I, it's not a conflation because when I was due to speak at Oxford, the reason I couldn't. Listen, I'm not bleating. I don't give a mm. shit about speaking at Oxford. But the problem was it was, a, it was a marriage between intolerant students demanding that a person without a uterus shouldn't be able to speak and the college caving into them. So there is an interplay between these two things. And this is a point Mill makes. Mm -hmm. You can't simply focus on legal restrictions on speech and ignore or even support informal restrictions on freedom of speech because number one that's contradictory and hypocritical and number two these two things are intimately related the more that you have this these rabble rousers these these informal networks demanding censorship the more you actually give a green light to the state then deciding down the line, well, maybe we need a law against this. If you only challenge state censorship and you ignore the intolerant students, and I'm sorry, but we have an example here, then you are not challenging censorship in the round. But, I mean, the, the idea that we have free speech is pretty a misnomer anyway, right? Exactly, okay. and that's the problem. Because, because everything that we say and everything we do is interpreted by people, right? You, earlier, you seem to suggest that people were misinterpreting your words, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not the words that are necessarily important, it's the ideas that are at the heart of them, yeah? So it's not the words that you say that is the issue, it's the ideas. It's the ability to say them. Right, I'm going to open up to questions. Before I do, the one thought I'm going to put out there as someone who was a student in the 80s was it strikes me that some of the things and speakers now who are being no-platformed, 30 years ago, they would have come to speak, the police would probably have um, you know, police them, and you've had big, noisy protests outside. Is that the key difference? That actually we just assumed these debates took place and you, you expressed your opposition through a protest, whereas now it's sort of been internalised and there is a process mm. of no platforming. Is that, is that what's happened? Yes. Would you say? I think, no, well... The, the debates yes. still happen on campus. The students yeah, yeah. have become the Every police. two years we have to like, review all of our policies. We don't just like, decide this is a policy and we keep it forever. So the debates do continue. Again, it's an assumption that we don't discuss it and debate it amongst ourselves. A tiny group. Which we okay. do. No, it's not a tiny group. It's a very small group. Let's take questions then. We've got a mic here. We've got lots of questions. Right, going to take the gentleman there with the light blue T-shirt first. Can we keep the questions nice and short, please, so that we can get responses? <laughs> or if you want to make a point, make your punchy point. No, that gentleman just there. No, we'll do it with the mic. Because they are recording it too. And then the internet can know. 
To what extent do you feel that you can debate <laughs> feminism objectively as opposed to on an individual basis? So can you repeat that, please? To what extent do you feel you can discuss feminism on an objective basis as opposed to on an individual basis, and which do you feel is more productive? And is that addressed to anyone in particular or everyone? Uh, everyone. I think everyone has right. an equal platform here. <laughs> God, where do we start? <laughs> Short question, I'm not sure. Um, Let's take another question. Let's we'll think about that and bring it up. Do you want to take the lady in the very front here? Sorry, I felt uninspired to play straight away. But it's a good question. Go ahead. Is um, part of the issue that we're not too sure exactly how public a university is? Because I think even Brendan mentioned that if you're a private institution, you are free to discriminate who you, know, who you have in there. It's part of the issue that we're not too sure because you have to pay to the privilege to be at a university, you know, to take part in a student union, you have to be a student there. So is that really the main issue that we're not sure whether it's in the public domain or the private domain or, or to is, what extent? Is that, that's a good point. Is it, is it yeah. we don't really know where? Well, I mean, student unions to me private. are the equivalent of private clubs, really. You know, that's, that's you know, they have a discrete, discrete membership in there and they organise themselves. They're not... That, you know, they're connected to the university, but they're not wholly <coughs> run by the university. I mean, obviously, the university has a kind of duty of care and oversight to something else. But, but how students organise themselves within the student union, that's that's kind of There is a kind of arm's length thing. What's your relationship like with the governing body? Do they... I mean, do you have, Sorry, what's no, your relationship like with the governing body when these kinds of rows erupt? Do they just get involved if you ask them to? Who, who are you referring to the, the governing student body? Union. Sorry. Yeah. Goldsmith Student Union, what's yeah. its relationship with the governing body of the university when it comes to... As in, to like, the senior management, as in the college itself, not the SU. Um, what's the relationship of the sorry. student union right, yeah. with the people who run the actual university, you know, the, right. the chancellor and the vice-chancellor, oh, when it comes to <laughs> an issue like, uh, you know, an issue of who should be allowed on or off? Do they um, ever ask to get involved? Are you? Um, no, they're kind of, well... Um, I mean, I, can, I suppose I can use, I can use my example, the, the thing that happened with me, the media shitstorm, whatever, like, as an example. Like, um, so the student union were backing me and supporting me because ultimately they saw it as like, yeah. um, unfair right-wing attacks just because like, we wanted to, some BME women wanted to organise yeah, autonomously on campus. Yeah, but what did the campus. university do? University just washed their hands they of it. Okay. Because, they have, because their idea of um, sort of equality and diversity, whatever, is very much kind of in conjunction with what this, you know, like the Equality Act in 2010, what the right, state decides. Law. Okay. Not, yeah, which isn't necessarily what, like, the SC. But ahead, this then. is the double standard I'm talking about. So it's fine for you to say kill all white men, which I don't have a problem with. You can say Allegedly. whatever you want. I'm still under police investigation. Yeah, so yeah, I whatever. I, I think are you? the police. Are you? are you? Really? Yeah. The police investigation into that is an outrage. Yeah. I think they should bugger off. But it's not okay for rugby lads to publish a pamphlet saying mingers. I mean, um, talk about double standards. This is what I'm talking were about. Were they arrested, In though? relation to... No, but they were banned. And now they're, they're standing in the street with their Maoist okay, signs around you, their like, neck. I mean, okay, so this is the thing I'm talking about. Are you scared about. of me? Do you think I might actually kill you? Are oh, you I'm actually... not scared of anyone, love. <laughs> well, what I'm all saying right, love. is... All right, mate. Right, what, uh, what <laughs> well, friends, and you said love. Well, no, I, I feel... Just, no, I feel I'm this saying that, like... Yeah. The, it's like, a class the thing only, is where I come from. Okay, fine. What I'm saying is... What I'm saying is I think people should be free to express any idea and any view that they want, including the idea that you should kill all white men. Right, I don't want to but then the you can't, No, I'm sure you don't, right? But then you can't turn around and say that this person shouldn't be allowed yeah. to say this, or this person... Go ahead, that's man. the double standard well, I'm talking about. Well, the question was that the public-private division. Um, did you want to say something, Pam? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, student unions, as I say, have a, a separate relationship, and they organise events on their own. So the university doesn't get... In char is not in charge of all of those. I mean, obviously, they wouldn't let them do anything illegal, but apart from but that... why is censorship only bad if it's done by the university? No, I'm not saying that, but you said earlier that if it was a private club, people yeah. could do what they want. So why isn't a student union part of that private club? Because okay. it impacts on all the other students. If you ban Robin Thicke's song, Blurred Lines, which numerous colleges around Britain have done, that impacts on all the students. Because they can't listen to the radio, obviously. Mm -hmm. You can go out of the student union and wow. listen to okay. it. Wow, OK, so, right, right. right. this is the clarification. Question. I'm There's a difference about. between... How do you this, mean? The, the, I thought this was three people who were generally in favour of freedom of speech and one person who obviously wasn't. This, is, this has now been utterly rectified. There are three people who are not remotely in favour of freedom of speech and only one person who is. Mm. So can I have any supporters in the audience, please? Right. Anyone? Let's take the lady in the blue Anyone? shirt over there. I think... I just yeah. think that you're the right. The lady in the blue shirt, um, fourth row from the back. Thank you. 
Can I say, it's a tough gig to chair, so you've done really well. Yes. <laughs> it reminds me of the 1980s, yeah. what can I say? <laughs> I think what's, what's really clear is that, you know, we all have different lines of what really triggers us. Um, but one of the things that I think Baha just said in passing, which is really important, you said there's a safe space policy. Uh, Pamela also talked about, you know, respectful discussion of issues. But you said everything can be discussed. And just going back to this year's events, it seems that people who disagree with statements that they see as misogynistic or transphobic then launch an extremely aggressive, full frontal assault. So whether you agree with the line and where it's drawn or not, what do the panel think about the response? You know, if you've got some line somewhere, how do you, what are the sanctions if someone breaks it? Because what I've seen has actually been devastating to individuals who've spoken mm. out. That's a good question. Who wants to take that first? Do you want to take that first, Baha? No, I'd like to take that a bit later. You want to take that a bit yeah, later? Yeah. Do you want to you take to that first, Pam? I mean, I think, I think you're right. I mean, again, but I think it depends on the context. I and mean, this is why it's important to think about speech acts rather than just speech, because it, it, it depends on, on, the, on uh, what they said, where they said it, and who is in opposition to it. Um, and how it comes. I mean, it, it's, you know, the kind of, the trolling on social media is, is horrendous to some people. Um, and, uh, uh, but that's not necessarily the same as being, you know, sort of like institutionally supported or not supported, if you see what I mean. So if somebody says something offensive in my classroom, I will deal with it there, and I'll say, well, to be honest, quite often I don't have to do it with others because the other students will say you shouldn't have said that. And quite often, people don't, are expressing views and they're clumsy in the way they say it. They don't necessarily mean to be offensive. And that's what I mean about having a safe space in the classroom. So if someone says something that's a bit out of order, nobody else jumps on them and kind of goes, you mm. can't say that. It gives kind of go, well, you know, did you mean to say that? Let's, let's explore it. And that, to me, is what a safe space is. It's not the banning of speech. It's not censorship. It's just thinking about the words that we use and the context that we use them. But the point of the question, I want B to respond, because this is the heart of your letter, to be is on that particular issue, on the transgender issue, the, the, the scale and the threats and the unpleasantness of the response on that issue is so extreme, what can you do about it? Because that isn't about negotiating the classroom. It's obviously a trigger issue in that sense, isn't it? I mean, that was why you were protesting. Well, it was edifying. It was very interesting to see the confident <coughs> contempt and abusiveness that was just <coughs> turned out minute by minute. And what it reminded me of was the way in which profoundly, uh, kind of ravishingly misogynist abuse lays its mind to the most extraordinary scenarios. <coughs> you think, how did that get into your head? This is not just about a disagreement. It's about mm. throwing scenarios into the conversation that your mind doesn't... You don't want to go there, actually. So there was something of that in the tone. And what it made me think was that the... Well, I mean, lots and lots of, of feminists have been writing very interestingly, trying to excavate what on earth is going on here and where we've got to in that conversation is, isn't it an interesting thing that the one category that is verboten now is feminists trying to air, trying to have a conversation, that's all, and including feminist men, have a conversation about what gender means in a context mm. where we've got a new issue to deal with. That's no, interesting. Um, so that's really the key. I want to add another thing here, which is that in addition to the conversation about what does or doesn't constitute gender relations and what does and doesn't uh, inhere to that, which is a politics that's absolutely about power, domination, subordination, and all of that. The other thing that's really important about this is the way in which the way in which 
All sorts of categories, if you like, corollaries, also become verboten. So it's now not possible to talk about um, sexual exploitation through prostitution without it being alleged. Well, it is possible. We do it all the time. But it is alleged that you're killing prostitutes by, or p killing women in the, in the sex work, uh, in sex work, by saying, no, you can't do this. I or should we say, want to we change. had this discussion here. I don't know how many of you came to it, but it was very polarised. So the key thing then very becomes, polarized. do you die because I disagree with you? This was what was in the letter in, that was published in Diva, uh, in the Observer, and then reported brief, in Diva. Because we've got to wrap up. Okay. Do you die because there's a debate? We've challenged. I have challenged. No doubt, people in this room have challenged I've people to have a conversation it, in and around the NUS no platforming about the transgender issue, and there is no response. And there's no response because I am not going to sit around a table with people who want to kill me. But and there is no response because you can speak, you have privilege. So the, the, something dangerous has happened to the way in which debate is debated. Well, and that's what I'd like to have the, revisited. The, I defend, I want to defend I just wanted, I've got to, free got, speech because... I need to look... I mean, in the name, finished. actually, of releasing the conversation about gender. It seems to me you just Giving, agreed with Brendan on something, which is the yes. idea that something dangerous has happened to the climate of debate. <laughs> we do agree. The, the, but we disagree also. No, but it's really because important. Because the thing is, but that's um, the point. Really the thing is, to see what the, I agree, agree that that's the, the point. I agree. We want to be in the same room having a disagreement. I agree. Yeah. I, that's I, all. I, I agree that trans activists are nuts. I mean, I didn't excuse say that. No, well, I said it. Trans activists are extremely intolerant. They will not tolerate any criticism of their view, of their ideology, of their politics. And that in itself is an interesting phenomenon. That is and, interesting. And, but, but on top of that, this is coming back to the point I made at the beginning. The idea that debate kills you, and I think B is absolutely right to call that into question. The idea that debate kills you, debate harms you, that's an idea that has a, a longer tradition. And I think it comes in part, I mean, it's existed for a long time, but it comes in part from the feminism of the 1970s and 80s, really? which argued... Can, can I please I think finish you... one sentence? Which argued that pornography causes rape. Misogynistic culture causes murder. Violent video games cause people to kill each other. This media effects theory has existed for a long time. Now, you can't turn around to the young students today who say that discussing transgenderism is a form of violence and be shocked because the conflation of words and violence has existed for a long time. And it comes back to my argument that today's student, intolerant student leaders are the bastard children you do it all the time. Okay, of um, the media effects theory feminism that, that developed in the 70s and 80s. Okay, That's my argument. You have argument. said that point a few times. There is a uh, there was Very briefly, because yeah, I'd like yeah, to have the final word. There were as many feminists arguing against that point Not of view as in many, the 70s. But there were some. No, there were as many. They didn't get the same, same airtime, but yeah, there was yeah. as many. I know. Like, Thank you. It's not, and it, One it of them's a columnist this, for Spike, Wendy Cameron, you should all read her. And it lists, the, these ideas about ideas and action predate feminism, right? It's not like something yes. that feminism invented. So That's why are you blaming said. feminism for I'm that? I'm not blaming it. I just said it's existed for a long time. Okay, well, you've made that point. Feminism rehabilitated it in the 1980s. You've made this point several times, that's Brendan, why I'm we've heard saying, it. Yeah. Uh, but I'd like you to have the last word on this <laughs> issue, and indeed, I mean, on the on the discussion tonight, because on the, on the whole discussion, yeah, like just... wrap it all up with a bow. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oh God, no, no, no I can't. Well, not, not, what I can't we established, which I think is really important, was this <laughs> idea that some debates, in particular, have actually got a level of aggression around them, yeah. which means that we're all agreed there's something fundamentally wrong here in what's happened to the ability to have a discussion about a contentious mm -hmm. issue. Think, Are you in agreement with that yeah. principle for a start? Yeah. That's quite yeah. interesting. Uh, well, no, I think. I mean, I think. I think. I think there's like a distinction as well that like isn't necessarily being addressed as like distinction between kind of people talking about like debate. Like, like what you said earlier about like tra trans activists, um, like not f like feeling that like debate is killing them, but the thing is, trans activists and sex workers and, and other and other minorities um, don't. Then the argue isn't the argument isn't that like debate is killing them. They're saying that like the the, the structural inequality, which means that their very existences are like brought into debate, are, are, are denied, is what's killing them. What? They're saying that they just don't want their lives to be debated by people who don't directly experience their lives, the direct experience, what it's like to be a trans woman, to be a sex worker, etc. Well, that's life. That's it, it, all our lives are debated by all sorts of people. That's life. Mm. Not just have to get used to it. No. Okay. no get used to it. Mm.
the, all the MRA. Well, well, let, let's, I mean, we do need to end it then. And I want to end just by asking each of you, in, in a sentence, if you could, to say, is there anything you've heard tonight from this discussion that has made you rethink or change your view about the whole issue of what is and isn't acceptable? <laughs> it's possible. No, I'm a very stubborn radical, so uh, no. Okay, <laughs> I still, I'm still believing the things I believe in. I still, I'm still have yeah, conviction. I'm, I'm more committed to freedom of speech now than I was before because it seems to me that there are a numerous slippery arguments against it and we need to go out and wage war against them. Okay, B, what about Yeah, you? I've learned a lot. I'm very grateful to you. I've really learned a lot about the kind of distinctions that you've drawn about the spaces where some of this stuff is being sorted out or not. And I've learned a lot, I have to say, from your tone. Um, because you were illuminating, you were researched, you were thoughtful, and you were generous. And I'm very grateful to you for that. Pam, okay. what Be about there. you? I don't know what to say now. Um, um, <laughs> um, what, if anything, have you learned or have, have rethought as a result of this discussion? I don't discussion? think I've learned anything, necessarily. But I... Um, um, <laughs> apart from the fact that I think a lot of this debate is actually not looking at not really dissecting the complexity and mm. that is part of the problem is mm. that people throw around terms like safe spaces feminism it's all this it's all that without really going into the complexity mm. yeah. and perhaps it's my job as an academic to try and make them listen to the complexity a bit more okay. if because it's only by that understanding the complexity of the debates that we're actually going to move anything forward. Mm. That's a really great I place agree. to end. Yeah. I'd like to thank you for all your questions. That was quite a lively debate. I'd like to thank all the panellists for agreeing to be here and have an honest conversation because I think it was honest. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Right, well done all. Thank you.